coming up on this episode of the Almost False Podcast. Things started getting crazy. He's like, in 15 years of working in this village, I've never seen anything like that. We're praying for people and people that are crippled or getting up and walk. People that are blind are seeing it. It's miracles happening. I'm calling my wife on the phone. I'm like, I don't believe half this stuff that I'm seeing. The pastor goes, I want to ask you something. But you can say no. And he says, there's this family and they live at the top of the mountain. But what would happen a lot of times is the missionaries would come back down the hill and kind of bad stuff would happen. So we go up this mountain. I could feel like a static electricity that was going on. And then it's like, you know, the thought grows through your mind, like, well, what if they dose the tear? She was like, the reason I invited you into my home was because when you hugged me, the only spirit that I could feel was the spirit that came with you. She's like, all the other spirits that we work with left. Hello and welcome back to the Almost False Podcast, where I interview regular people with incredible stories. Today, our guest is Ken Errington, and I am not exaggerating when I say that he has one of the most unbelievable stories I have ever heard. It went viral on TikTok a few months ago, and today we'll unpack it in a longer and more detailed way. I'll leave his links in the description below if you want to check him out after this. He's a fascinating person and a great man, so it was an honor for me to interview him. With all of that out of the way, let's get right into the story with Ken. My wife and I were living in New Orleans, and I was running a paranormal museum there. And just that was my life was the paranormal, the occult, witchcraft, things like that. But my wife and I, we had been married for three years. And no, we had been married for a year at that time. And she became pregnant and we moved back to our home state, North Carolina. We were going to have our first child. Perfect pregnancy. Everything was great, wonderful. And then a few days after Thanksgiving in the seventh month of her pregnancy, the baby stopped moving, went to the hospital, emergency cesarean. There had been umbilical cord trauma to the baby, just like a freak thing. And we lost our son at five days old. But in that Sorry. encounter or in that moment of losing our son, there was this, this presence that like filled the room and was very comforting. And Whereas we should have been going through horrible anguish, and we were in a lot of regards, but in this moment, there was this peace that I'd never really experienced before. And I'd been involved in a lot of crazy things and experienced a lot of strange things, but never anything that was peaceful like this. And so my wife went on this crazy search and she had started this new job. She made these new friends who were going to a church and, and I was fine with that. She starts going to church and I didn't mind. I grew up in the faith. I, mean, I believed in a God. I just didn't necessarily believe in, you know, Yahweh, so to speak. And I had spent a life involved with all different types of religions. And yeah, you know, I believed in like a universal force kind of deal. Right. And, and uh, fast forward a few months later, she starts going to church. I started attending church with her because I love my wife. And I will always support her, even though at the time I wasn't very comfortable with the whole church thing. But we started going to church and that led to a very powerful face-to-face encounter with, with Jesus um, after a couple of months. And I don't want to go too much into details because that's, that's not okay. the focus of this conversation, but like had a very powerful, powerful face-to-face encounter with, with Jesus. And then I was had a conundrum. It's like, okay, well, what do I do now? I've had an experience with all these other things, but now I know that Jesus is real. It's different when you know, when it's not something that I'm accepting necessarily on on faith. And there is a lot of faith in that, trust me. But but when you physically know and there's no doubt anymore, well, things have to change and you have to make a decision. And so my my wife and I, we went in head first. Like there was, we did not tread in the shallow end of the pool. It was not just a Sunday morning experience for us. It was our life. It was all of a sudden your whole life changed. Everything, everything. And so we dove into the deep end and we became those Christians that freaked other Christians out because of the backgrounds that we came from and who we were and the life that we were leading. And then all of a sudden we hit this 180. It threw a lot of people off, even in the church institution that we were a part of at that time. It freaked a lot of people out. They didn't understand our passion. And that scares, scared people. But we had an amazing pastor who became a close friend. And instead of him being frightened of us, uh, he was like, wow, the Lord really has something 
special for these two. And so what ended up happening is <laughs> we get invited to this conference with all this stuff's going on. And there's this guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. His name is George Mbanov. And he's this Romanian guy, and he's known as the man of joy, the apostle of joy. He's just really happy all the time, and he's really hyper. And so he's speaking at this church that some friends of ours pastor, and we got invited by this other group. So we go to this church. He, like, all of a sudden makes this call. He's like, anybody who wants to be a missionary, I feel the call of missionaries. You know, I'm butchering his accent right now. But he's like, (laughs) come to the front, come to the front. And my wife, like, beelines like Moses through the Red Sea, man. Like, she's like, because that was a serious part of her heart, you know? And she goes walking forward, and I'm like, oh, crap, man, because I didn't want to be a missionary. I had grown up in church hearing the horrible stories of missionaries. Oh, my life's so horrible. I need money. Give me money. You know, that sort of thing. And I was just like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. But like, she's like filling this call. See, she goes up, right? And so I'm like, oh, gosh, all right. So I follow her and he's coming down the line. He's praying for people. And that dude gets to me and puts his hand on my head. And I wake up like, I don't know, sometime later just like laughing and giggling. I've had like this crazy experience. Where did you wake up? Dude, it was crazy. Like, like I see, I had grown up and I had seen all this fake falling out in the spirit stuff, you know, that people had done. Mm-hmm. Like I grew up in a Pentecostal household at the time and like people getting you know slain in the spirit, tapped on the head. And, and I, I had seen people fake that growing up. Right. So mm-hmm. I thought it was all fake. I was like, this stuff ain't real. Uh, it's just mass hypnosis and mass hysteria, you know, uh, you know, collective hysteria, blah, blah, blah. That day I went out, I was out, like out cold. And when I woke up, I remember just like my sides hurt because apparently I had just laid on the floor and laughed for like 20, 30 minutes. The craziest <laughs> stuff. Like I was just like, what is this? Like, what? right. And so like I get up and like, but all of a sudden I'm like, all right, this mission work like, cool. Right. So within, I think two months we were in India. Wow. That went quick. And we were in like the deepest, darkest parts of like in the slums, like seeing crazy stuff and praying for people and like stuff out of movies. And I was just like, all right, all right, Lord, this is getting a little intense. This is a little weird. (laughs) And uh, I went back to India another time. And my wife and I, at that point, we were like, all right, this is our life. This is what we want to do. We want to be missionaries. You know, we want to go to the like the hardest places. We want to go do this, that, and the other. And we were trying to put together, like, how can we move? My wife and I, we were like, how can we move to India? How can we move somewhere abroad? Like we're being called abroad, right? But everything kept falling through just things weren't matching up. Things weren't sequencing right. And then I get invited to go to Cuba. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm all about that. Because I'd always wanted to go to Cuba. I'd been to a lot of Caribbean countries. I, I love the Caribbean. I was like, yeah, let's go to Cuba. And so I got invited. And that's how I ended up in Cuba. I went, my wife, had we had just had our second baby. After our son died, years later, we had a daughter. And then we had another son. And like six weeks after our son was born, I was on a plane to Cuba. We get there, and as soon as we got there, things started getting crazy. We get to Cuba, um, and we are in, I don't want to say too much of the area that we're Mm -hmm. in, but we're in South Cuba. And, you know, there's a lot of people, when they think of Cuba, they think of Havana. But it's kind of like when someone comes to America, and they go to New York City, and they think they've been to America. No, you've been to New York City. So it's kind of the same thing. And in Cuba, it's like a lot of people think Cuba is like Havana. It's not. It's very different. Our contact there, we meet up with him. We drive to this little village that's in the shadow of the mountains. And and as soon as we go to his house, we're just hanging out, you know, kind of getting acclimated. It was really hot. It was February, but it was really hot. And the pastor that we're meeting there, he's like, well, hey, do you want to come to our little church? And basically it was just, <laughs> uh, it's not a church the way we think of church. It's, it's basically just kind of like a big concrete, like open space. Because if you have a church in Cuba, if it gets too big, the government will step in and they'll reallocate the building and then they'll put Uh-oh. you back in a little building. Again. <laughs> wow. So he invites me to go look, let's go look at his church. And he's proud of his church and he should be because he's worked really hard. And we, walk over to his church and on the way over there, there's this woman and she's wearing black dress. It's kind of the standard like housekeeper wear. Um, Mm -hmm. She's like sweeping the floor and there's, cause there's a school next door. So she's like sweeping like the concrete pad that's outside where all the kids play. And we're walking by and I just feel like the Lord strongly on me just saying, 
he wants this woman to know how much he loves her. And I was like, okay. So we're walking along and I'm like, you know, hey, pastor, pastor, I'm not going to, I can't name his name, but um, pastor, I was like, can you translate for me? I just feel like the Lord is telling me something for this woman. And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. So we walk over and there's this fence between us. So I was like, pastor, I need you to, you know, translate everything I say exactly as I say it. And he's like, okay. So like the Lord, just like, I just feel like the Lord start pouring out this love on this woman. So I just start telling her like things, like I just know things about her life. And I'm like, the Lord's telling me how much he loves her and how much she has a heart of, a heart of sacrifice that the reason she works, you know, and that he honors that and he just wants to bless her with love. And I'm saying all this stuff to her and I can tell, cause I had a few years of Spanish and I can tell he's not translating exactly what I'm saying. He's very hesitant with the words that I'm saying. And we had another person that was with us who did speak fluent Spanish and she looked over at me and she said, he's not saying what you're saying because in his understanding of how Jesus relates to people, this violated his understanding because this woman was a witch. Uh. And so Santeria in this area of Cuba is one of the dominant religions. So Santeria is a syncretic religion that blends Catholicism with magic. It's not voodoo. It's Yoruba magic, which is from Africa, and it commingles together. And so they'll pray to Christian saints, but they're actually not Christian saints. They're Orishas, which are basically, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, energy forces, so to speak, or you could say, you know, gods, gods. And so that's okay. really kind of going a little too far, but basically forces, we'll call it that way. And he doesn't want to tell her exactly what it is that I'm saying, because in his understanding of Jesus, his understanding of faith, from an Old Testamental, Old Covenantal standpoint is kind of a, a violation of his belief system. And I was like, Pastor, I need you to just say exactly what it is that I'm saying. I was like, I know this is difficult, but I need you to say exactly. And he said, okay. And he actually did this time. And as soon as he said what I said, her whole face, like the entire countenance of her face changed and she like, like stiffened up a little bit, but not in a bad way. Just like, like there was this realization that came on her and she starts crying. And I'm just like, look, Jesus loves you. Jesus has been watching you. Jesus has his heart on you. Jesus created you for a relationship with him. And she's just getting wrecked, man. She's just like just getting totally like blasted and we're, and there's this fence in between us. So we go into his church and next thing you know, like two minutes later, she comes around the corner and she's like holding all these little idols in the century in faith. There's a, a necklace that you wear. We call it a puka shell necklace for them. It's for protection. And she's taking everything off because it, it okay. symbolizes the protection of their gods. And she's taking everything off. She's taking off and she hands it to me. And it just took you saying those few words to her. And all of a sudden she threw everything that she knew out. That's it. And she was like, and she was like, I just, she could, because She's going through an encounter, like all this arguing stuff. This is why I don't engage a lot of times with this stuff on TikTok and on social media when people want to argue. Mm -hmm. No one has ever been argued into the kingdom of heaven. Not one person. I don't care who you are. All right. Not one person. You're not argued into the kingdom of heaven. There are some people who may be convinced by arguments that there's something going on, but the Lord is after a relationship, right? And so... She comes over, she just hands everything over and like his mouth's on the ground. He's like, in 15 years of working in this village, I've never seen anything like that. And he's stunned. So from that point on, like literally the rest of the trip, he's saying exactly what I say, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, all right, I'm good. So, so we, so she hands in like all our idols and stuff. She starts like basically following us around like everywhere, right? And she starts talking to other ladies in the village. And next thing you know, the pastor's phone starts blowing up and people are like, send the long haired, curly, long haired white boy over to our <laughs> house. And we would go to these houses of these witches and they would have all their stuff, all their idols, like piled up outside. And wow. they would just like come inside and just tell us about Jesus. So that's what we did. They had never heard that version of Jesus before. Uh, they, they, they didn't had this was, this was totally, they had heard about Jesus's love, but they had never, I think, experienced that. You know what I mean? And they had experienced the other witchcraft and the other gods, but they had never experienced the, the trueness of the Christianity, right? So for them, Christianity was an idea and right. the other thing was real. But when you showed up 
and you brought right. the real with the Christianity, it kind of shook their worldview. Right. So next thing you know, we had been there. We had a team of like it was me and <laughs> it was me and three ladies all in their sixties. That was our our mission team. So like three days later, three hundred and fifty people in this little tiny village show up. Like everyone in this village is trying to stuff themselves into this little church. And I'm not even allowed to talk in the church because that's like American, I'm white. That don't happen. But the pastor was like, I need you to speak anyway. So I was like, all right, that's fine. So I, you know, I got up and I just talked about like the love of Jesus. And I don't know if it's a frequency that was being released for that time, but things were happening and people I had never, I, I, like I said, man, I'd, I'd been to, to India numerous times. I'd done mission work across the United States. We did stuff in church, you know, all the time, but we're praying for people and radical things are happening. And if you watch any of my stuff on TikTok, if you watch any of my stuff on social media, you know that I'm a very rational, logical, historic verification type of person. Yes. But we're praying for people and people that are crippled are getting up and walk. People that are blind are seeing it. It's miracles happening. And all of a sudden, these stories start to spread to these other villages. And so we're starting to go to these other villages. And the story comes to us that the secret police are looking for us, me specifically. So we're, we do everything by foot. There's no car driving anywhere. We're, you know, we're, we're walking everywhere. And the pastor is like, if you see a moped with two guys on it, look the other way. Uh, and I'm like, okay. You know, and there's all these mopeds with two. And I'm like, two. Every moped has two people on it. <laughs> He's like, just look the other way. Yeah, and I'm like, all right. But it was, it was, it was a lot of fun, just like watching the Lord work. And there was a moment where the police showed up. We were walking from one village to another, and we, as Americans, we, we were there on tourist visas, so we were supposed to be in a certain area, and we were out of that area. We weren't being good tourists. We were, you know, somewhere where we weren't supposed to be, because. People had asked us to come and pray for them. Yeah. And so we're on our way back. And all of a sudden, the police come up around the corner. And the pastor that's with this is like, no matter what happens, look ahead. Don't look back. Just keep looking ahead. Keep walking forward. Don't look at them. Just keep walking forward. And they start slowing down as they come approach because it's pretty obvious. I mean, it was me and this other woman. We're the only white people. We kind of stick out, you know. And, and so we're walking, you know, kind of down this hill. And it's like, like, I just know they are coming for us. They're finally tracking us down. They finally got a reason to kind of do something. And just then, dude, I, this, <laughs> just then about 150 goats come out of nowhere and walk across the road and stop. And what? the police can't get past the goats. And they're like honking the horn and they're like, doing all, and it's this little, little road. It's not like, you know, it's not like a, a, a road. It's this little mountain road. And so like it literally, there's like 150 some odd goats just standing in the road. And not crossing, just the car stand, can't get standing around in the middle of the road, blocking the police. Just, just walked up into the middle of the road and stopped in the middle of the road. And at that point, <laughs> at that point our contact's like walk faster walk faster i know a path so we leave and we like go through the woods and that was that and so it was just like wow. all types of weird little things going on you know like just weird stuff where it's like you stop worrying about things because at this point in time you're like all right well if this all is happening the lord is obviously keeping us safe yeah. so we start getting a little bolder and so we're, we're back in this village and we're there for a few more days and crazy miracles are happening. Stuff that I have a hard time in my rational mind still looking back today and going, did that really happen? Like, did that really happen? Like prayed for a dude with brain damage that had multiple nerve damage in like, it hadn't been able to open his hands in years. And he was really high up in the Cuban military before he retired. He had heard about us. So he you know, he called for me to come over and this dude's got like, like gnarled up hands. He hasn't been able to open his hands in years. And we just start talking to him about, you know, the love of Jesus and how Jesus, you know, like wants to see it. Like I'm feeling like, you know, I'm supposed to say it. And like, like there's a lot of me that's like, 
I don't want to say this because I don't want to give this guy's hopes up and nothing happened. Right. You know, like that thought's going through my mind. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, you know what? You know what? I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going for it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was like, man, I was like, I feel like the Lord wants to see your hands open up. And his wife's translating and she's just like, uh, you know, she, she's been doing this dude for like 20 something years with his hands all gnarled up. Right. Yeah. So we start praying for him. And next thing you know, his like hands like start opening up and, and, that, and then he starts like moving his hands back and forth and he's screaming, his wife's screaming, running down the road and like in happiness, like all this crazy stuff's happening. And it's just like, what the heck is going on? And it's just Jesus. Like I took the model from like what the Bible said, you know, and, and when Jesus, when he would heal people, he never healed anybody the same way twice. And it's like, we go through all this stuff in our Western minds. We're like, oh, well, people aren't getting healed because they've got unforgiveness or people have just, that's all garbage. I'm telling you right now, it's all garbage. Like, cause that is not in the gospels. There's nowhere in the gospels where Jesus said, I would heal you, but you have unforgiveness in your heart. <laughs> never said anything like that. You know, he's like, all right, by your faith, you're healed, you know? And, and so all this stuff and, and beyond belief, I'm calling my wife on the phone. I'm like calling her up on the phone. And I'm just telling her everything that's going on. I'm like, I don't believe half this stuff that I'm seeing. <laughs> you even being there and witnessing all of it, you were having trouble processing all of it in your head. I'm having trouble, man. Like I'm having trouble. And I'm I'm wrecked because like because it's not me. Because I can tell you, I've played for plenty of people and ain't nothing happened. You know <laughs> what I mean? You know, I'm I'm being honest. I've played yeah. for a lot of people and ain't nothing happened. You know, but here I am there and like all this stuff's going on, right? And I'm like, all right, the Lord's doing something, man. The Lord's, the Lord's doing something. He's setting something up. And uh, found out that they had tapped our phone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so they, the government like was still keeping tabs on us. They knew what we were doing. But uh, the last day, or the day before the last day we're there, the pastor goes, well, look, I want to ask you something. He's like, but you can say no. And, and I was like, okay. And he says, there's this family and they live at the top of the mountain. And I had heard whispers of this family, like when we were there, like when we would be praying for, for other people who were involved in Santeria and things like that, there was this talk about the family at the top of the mountain. So the pastor says, hey, look, there's this family and they live at the top of the mountain and they've, the family generationally has been at the top of the mountain for as long as anyone can remember. Because a lot of Santerian magic, their belief system, their Orishas, et cetera, et cetera, they're, they're passed intergenerationally. And this was like the big ones. Like when you were at the top of the mountain, pretty much in their faith, everything that you see is uh, under their domain. So when you're at the top of the mountain, you're looking out and they had spiritual basically control of of this area. And they're like the only ones at the top of the mountain. Yeah, right? they're the only ones at the top of the mountain. So the pastor says, hey, look, man, for years, missionaries and teams like that come in, you know, they, they go up there and they are looking for like, you know, a spiritual showdown, right? Like my God's greater than your God, my God's greater than you or that kind of stuff. You know? And like they were wanting that Elijah call down fire moment and rebuking witches and rebuking all this. And then conversely on the flip side, what happens is you come up, look, man, I'm telling you right now, like you come up to my property line, you start yelling stuff at me. I'm going to start yelling stuff at you. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? So that's, that's what they would do. So they would just start yelling back and forth at each other. But what would happen a lot of times is the missionaries would come back down the hill and kind of bad stuff would happen. Like they would have financial misfortune. Kids would get sick. Families get sick. Like somebody supposedly died like a short time later. So like people are very afraid of these people because they're working in power. They have power. So the village kind of like, it's not that they lived in fear, not fear in the way that we understand fear is like, oh, they're afraid. It's more like, oh, some sort of respect towards them. Don't mess with them or else something bad's going to yeah. happen. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're in like awe of these people. And so the pastor's like, look, man, after all this stuff that I've seen this week, I, can you come up there with me, you know, and let, let's go meet them. And I was like, yeah, let's do that, right? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Because I'm like on a spiritual high, right? That I haven't, yeah, I hadn't been on for a long time, right? You know, I'm just, you know, when you're seeing people that were blind seeing, when you're seeing people that, you know, have cancer happy and moving around like 
with tumors mounting off of them and people with unoperable nerve damage in their hands, opening their hands and then goats standing in the middle, of them, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm leaving a lot of stories out, but all that stuff's going on. Right. And, and so it's like, you, you kind of like, all right, yeah, let's do this. We have the conversation at night for dinner. And then the next morning he's like, we're going to go up the mountain because it's going to be an all day thing. Cause you got to go up the mountain and you know, like, like we want to talk to him and be respectful and all. And so, yeah, let's do it. Cause that was my rule. I was like, I'm not going up there to fight anybody, but I, I do want to go up there and see these people meet Jesus. You know what I mean? And so that morning, yeah, I'm, I'm praying and I'm like, all right, Papa, what you want to do today? You know? And, and I was like, Lord, I was like, give me access to these people's heart, Lord. Just let them, I want them to know you, you know, that sort of stuff. And like, and I really felt like Jesus come and kind of give me a pimp slap across the face. And he was like, I'm not going to give you access to their heart. And I was just kind of a little stunned and, and I didn't really know what to say. And he's like, I'm not giving you access to their heart unless you love them like I do. And that was the thing, like, it really struck me. I'd never really considered that before. It was like, after seeing all the stuff that was going on, going to people's houses and them having put their idols outside, you know, just welcoming me in their homes and you're praying over them and you're releasing the love of Jesus and all this sort of stuff. My head was starting to swell up a little bit. And the, the Lord just like really hit me. And it wasn't about, you know, it wasn't, I, I was looking at them and like a target. You know mm. what I mean? Like, I want to save the witches, you know, that sort of thing. And, and the Lord was like really on me about that. And he was like, he is, he, the, the, basically that's just cold blood manipulation. And uh, he was like, I don't want you to do that. He goes, I just want you to just go up there and I just want you to love them. And no matter the cost, you know, I was like, all right. All right, that's 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 what we're gonna do. And like then the Lord actually just showed me like the witch's perspective on Christians. And literally, for as long as these people could remember, all their experience of of Christians were people coming up to the edge of their property and yelling at them and rebuking them and telling them that they're evil and telling them that they're horrible and telling them that all this stuff. But in their belief system, they didn't see themselves as evil. They didn't see themselves as horrible. They didn't see themselves as awful people. They were doing things that they thought were for the good of the community, working with spiritual forces to protect people because people would come up there and they would pay to you know, tell them their future or would you know, give them animals or food or whatever if they would pray for them to be healed from spiritual forces or sicknesses. And like the Lord showed me, he's like, they're not evil. They're lovely, wonderful people that are helping other people in the way that they understand in the way that they know about the world. And it reminded me, and I was just like, man, that's exactly right. Because that's, like I said, I used to own an occult bookstore back in my mid twenties before I was Christian. Yeah. Uh, I was deeply involved in the cult and the nicest people I had ever met literally were witches, were people that were involved in the cult. And some of the meanest people I'd ever met and still to this day have ever met claim Christianity. Wow. My nastiest comments that I get on any of my social media posts does not come from atheists, does not come from witches, does not come from pagans, does not come from anybody like that. The meanest, nastiest comments that are directed toward me and my family on social media come from people who claim they follow Jesus. Why do you think that is? Superiority complex. We want to believe that what we believe is right and we will destroy others in the process to make people believe that. We forget to ask the question, what was it about Jesus that called to the sinful and the immoral? What was it about Jesus that made people that were considered the worst of the worst, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, what made them want to come to Jesus? What made them feel like they could pour their perfume out on his feet and dry his feet with their hair? Like... Yeah. What made those people feel like they could do that when all the religious people, all they did was just tell them how horrible and awful they were. And people want to know, oh, why is, why is the church dying? It's because they don't have the love of Jesus, period. Point blank. Boom. There you go. That's it. You have the love of Jesus. Things are going to happen. There's a lot of people that think that Jesus is in church and that Christianity is church. What you're saying is it's totally the opposite. The, the inst institution of the church is one thing. Yep. And Jesus and God is a totally different thing. And sometimes these two overlap, but sometimes they Absolutely. don't. Absolutely. Correct. 100%. Yes.
Paul said, yeah, I don't just come with words. I come with power. And that power is motivated by love. This is one of the things I'm known to say is Christians are known to want their Elijah moment. Uh, we're not supposed to have an Elijah moment. We're supposed to have a Jesus moment. You know, we love because he first loved us. Right. And so that's the attitude that I took going up this hill, you know, so we go up this mountain and it's not about proving my God's better. It's not about bringing them to the Lord. It's not about any of that. That's not my goal. My goal is not to bring them to the Lord. My goal is not for them to be saved. My goal is to go up there and love them like Jesus loved, because that's what he told me to do. And so, man, I went up that mountain. I was on cloud nine. The pastor that I'm with, he's like, let's just go do this thing. We go through the door, knocks, dun, dun, dun. Woman opens the door. And man, let me tell you, There was this woman that was with us who, before this trip, had never had any experience with anything like this. And like during this trip, she's seen like the most craziest things you can imagine. So like she's going up this hill and she is just like terrified of what we're getting ready to walk into. Right. And uh, we get there and the door opens. And like, I remember her catching like her breath because she was just stunned because the woman that was at the door. She wasn't wearing these robes that were dripping with, you know, sacrificial blood and, you know, all this crazy stuff. She was just a woman wearing a, a tank top and a pair of jeans and looked like any lady that you would see at a Walmart or a Target, right? She didn't look like some scary priestess of darkness and all this silliness, you know? And I, I knew to expect that just because, you know, just because of my past, I, I knew that, you know, like mm-hmm. they're normal people. So she steps outside in Spanish. She's you know, can I help you? And the pastor introduces me. And by this point, he is just literally repeating everything that I'm saying. His whole grid has been rocked, you know? And so he's just like, I'm all about this. Let's do this. And so he tells her exactly. I say, look, my name's Ken. Thank you for meeting me. I just want to come and bless your house. And I just remember like the flutter of her eyes, like her head kind of rocked back because she had never experienced anything like this for a person that, you know, says they know Jesus, right? Yeah. And um, she's like, see, you know, see, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's see where this thing goes. You know, like she had this <laughs> look of curiosity in her face, right? You know? And so she invited us. I was like, can I have a hug? Because in, in this part of this country, uh, it's customary to, when you meet someone uh, new for the first time and you're coming to the house to give them a hug and a kiss on the cheek. Okay. And so the woman that was with us gives her a hug and a kiss on the cheek. And then I give her a hug. But when I give her a hug, I felt like I was electrocuted, man. It was one of the best hugs I've ever had in my life. And I've had a lot of hugs. And But it was just like, like, I just felt like I knew this woman. Like she put her arms around me and she just like held so tight. And I just held, and I could feel stuff going on in the spirit. I could just feel it. I could feel like a static electricity that was going on. And after we hug, we separated and she's just got like tears running down her face. And she was like, yes, please come inside my home. And we go inside and her husband sitting across the room now, <sighs> trying to put this in a way that, that people can understand. So like going in this house, it was like this large open area where they would bring people in to pray for them and they would do their rituals and stuff like okay. this. So you've got all this stuff on the walls and you've got, <laughs> you've got, animal skulls and like jars, like full of like herbs and, and stuff like that. It's like, it's kind of like something out of a movie set to be honest with you. Um, and like all this stuff is set up and her husband just stands up and he's like stunned. Like who the heck is this long haired white dude doing in my house? <laughs> you know? And he's standing with the preacher man, you know? And mm. he's like, what is going on? So immediately, like he gets up and he has like white dust all over him because he's been doing divination rituals, basically like what with these shells, you know, you rattle shells and you throw them down. And when they land, you kind of like, it's kind of like casting lots. You, you kind of say, this is the will of, you know, the Orishas or whatever. So he's like literally right kind of in the middle of ritual like when we show up. So he stands up, I look right at him and I just walk right over to him. And before he even has a chance to do anything, I just reach out and I grab his hand and I'm just like, I'm so honored to be in your house. Thank you. I just want to come and and bless your house. And he's just, 
he doesn't know what to say. He's just like looking around and his wife is like nodding at him. He's like, okay. Because the only thing they had experienced from people that look like you, because there's not a whole lot of them over there, right? Is hatred. Yeah. In this part of Cuba, yeah. These are the little villages. This is not a city. This is not a town. This is in an area that is known for generations and generations and generations of century and priests. And so they invite us back for, for tea. And then it's like, you know, the thought grows through your mind, like, well, what if they dose the tea, right? <laughs> you're like, like you know, you know, you're like, you, you don't, you know, let's be real. Just, just be honest. You know, you hear stories about people you know, getting sick. And I was just like, you know what? I'm all in, man. I was like, yeah, bring on the tea. You know? So like, you know, I'm just, I start talking and I start telling them about my background and the things that I used to be involved in and, uh, and all that stuff. And, and they were just like leaned in, you know, they were like listening to every single thing, like drinking in everything. And we were there for hours, hours, like four or five hours, just talking. And finally at the end, they're like waiting for the moment for me to go for the conversion. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Right. You know, like they know enough about missionaries. Right. So they're waiting for it. And I'm like, that's not what I'm here to do. And finally, the woman pipes up and she's just like, how do I get? the spirit that you carry with you. And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, the reason I invited you into my home was because when you hugged me, the only spirit that I could feel was the spirit that came with you. She's like, all the other spirits that we work with left. And since you've been here, all of the spirits that we work with can't come in this house. And her husband was like nodding his head. So all of a sudden I realized, I was like, man, something's happened. Like, this is huge. This is like really amazing. Cause I'm not, you know, I didn't come in there before I walked in. I was like, oh, Father bless me. You know, none of that stuff, man. I just wanted to go there with Jesus' love and get to know these people and hear their story, you know, and, and then tell them my story. And so that's what we did. So the woman's like, how do I get what it is that you have? And I was like, well, this is the catch with that. I was like, if you want what I have, those other things that you're working with can't stay in the same space. And she was like, it's impossible. And I remember just, she started wringing her hands and she started saying, it's impossible. It's impossible. And because in their culture, this is the thing that people don't get in, in Western cultures. When you're in a culture that has familial gods. Okay. So gods that are passed down generationally, right. That you honor right? Christian deliverance ministries try to call them familiar spirits and stuff like that. But when you have these, these spirits that you work with and idols that have been passed down generationally, that's like your family's history. So I'm realizing as this comes to like all the stuff that's been going on while we've been in this country of people turning in their idols, they're literally turning in their entire family's history. They're wow. literally surrendering their inheritance to receive a different kind of inheritance. And that was a really powerful moment for me because I was just like, wow, these people are literally giving up everything they are or they've experienced because they're experiencing something different that is touching them in a way that they have never experienced. And she's like, it's impossible. She's like, I, my family, like we live here, <laughs> like we'll literally have to surrender everything. And I was like, look, I was like, I didn't come up here to convert you. I didn't, I just came up here to bless you and bless your home. So if you want the spirit that came with me to stay, that's great. If not, it doesn't change the fact that I think you're amazing and I love you and I honor you. And her daughter stood up and she was like, I want it. She was like 12 years old. And so her mom said, absolutely, you can. So we prayed over her daughter and it was like, it's just like, Jesus, just reveal who you are, you know, in every way and in ways that I can never comprehend in this little girl. And that was that. We left with hugs, you know, like big hugs. And like, thank you so much. I, I want, you know, you know, please come back. And the next time you come, please stay with us, you know, that sort of thing. And, and uh, it was amazing. So we go down the hill and the pastor's like, man, in 15 years, we've never seen anything like that. Those people, like, I've never seen them like that. I had no idea. But this is the deal. What happened was 
On leaving Cuba, I get detained at the airport. They give me some grief. They go through my clothes. I'm surrounded by like dudes with big old AK-47s and all this craziness. I ended up making it onto the plane. They, they end up letting me go. But we find out a very short time later that that family, because of that experience, did end up indeed basically giving everything for Jesus. Wow. And it was because of the changes that they were seeing in their little girl. Like she was having these terrible nightmares. They just stopped. She was having these, these physical issues stopped. She's like healed, like all this stuff's going on. So now that couple is actually, they're missionaries. Uh, wow. And what they do is they go to all of the other areas through the valleys, through the mountains, and they speak to other priests and priestesses like them. And they're literally just doing the same thing. They're not going to convert anybody. They go and they just express love in a way that they've never comprehended before. And the mother now runs the children's ministry for, I think, like six different churches or something like that. So like this woman who everybody used to be afraid of now, like literally every day spends different days with different children in different churches talking about Jesus and teaching them about Jesus in a way that they can go and just release that. So literally the pastor that I worked with, he's like, I've got a different problem. He's like, now I have to like disciple like literally hundreds and hundreds of people. And it all started because the Lord just said, I don't want you to go and convert people. I want you to go and love them. You know? And if you look through the scriptures, Jesus never said, go and convert nations. Jesus said, go and disciple nations. And how did he disciple his disciples? He discipled his disciples through love. And even they missed the mark constantly. I mean, they were, I mean, James and John, when they wanted to call down fire, right? Uh, They had been with Jesus for three years. Three years, these dudes had been with Jesus, night and day. They knew how Jesus liked his eggs in the morning. They had seen him pee off the side of the boat. Let's be real. We don't like to look at Jesus this way, but let's be real. It's true. Okay. This is how they knew him. They knew him intimately. They had been with him through thick and thin. They had seen him do massive healings. They had done healings in his name. They'd done all this stuff, but they still didn't know what spirit they were of. And that's a warning sign for all of us, I think, is that a lot of times we want to get in pissing contests and we want to prove that we're right and everyone else is wrong, you know, and all this garbage. And and Jesus doesn't care about any of that. Jesus had one directive. When the Pharisee looked and he said, Lord, what's the greatest commandment? And he's trying to nail him, all right? He's wanting him to quote, you know, something out of the quote unquote 10 commandments, even though they're different versions of the 10 commandments, you know, depending on which book of the Bible that you're reading. But instead, Jesus hits him out of left field with something out of Deuteronomy. Love the Lord with God with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. Second so command is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the first thing, the first thing we tried to do, the first thing that the Pharisee tried to do when Jesus said that, he said, well, who's my neighbor? Because he's trying to put qualification on who Jesus said it is for us to love. That's what we do. That's what religion does. It attempts to put qualification on who is accepting of Jesus's love. We do it with our Muslims deserving of Jesus's love, our LGBTQIA people deserving of Jesus's love. You can literally list them off. Yeah, and the answer is yes. Everyone is deserving of Jesus's love. It, and people don't want to say that, right? They're like, oh, you know, and th- no, the answer is yes. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Almost False Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more interviews like this. If you found this content valuable, please share it with a friend. It really helps us out a lot and hopefully it will help them too. If you want to be on the show, you can go to almostfalls.net and submit your story there. We would love to hear from you. With that being said, I hope you have a great rest of your day and stay blessed.